Thank you guys. How's everybody doing? Got a smile on your face? Ready to go? All right. Joe was opening a new business and one of his friends decided to send flowers for the occasion. The flowers arrived and Joe read the card. It said, rest in peace. <laughs> Joe, enraged, called the florist to complain. Anybody ever complain? Joe called the florist to complain. The florist replied, sir, I'm really sorry for the mistake, but rather than get angry, you should imagine this. Somewhere there is a funeral taking place and they have flowers with a note that says, congratulations on your new location. <laughs> uh, you'll get it in a minute. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I think sometimes we uh, get a little worked up with stuff and sometimes we just need to take a moment and take a breath. You know what I mean? Praise God. If you've ever worked in retail... You know, Dean, Dean works in retail. If you've ever done something like that, or, or really if you've worked any job, you've come across situations where you encounter people that, that what would benefit them most is just to take a breath. Mm -hmm. just, just to take, anybody ever told you, can you just take 10 seconds? Just process for a moment. You know, it'll do you a lot of good. Let's open, if you would, to uh, Matthew chapter 11. Yay, yay. We're going to continue on a message we started um, I guess it's been a couple weeks here, and that is called Faith Rest. Faith Rest. And, of course, we saw a lot of practical reasons, and, and we'll see a little bit more today, or tonight, rather, about, you know, the Bible says a lot about, actually, it says a lot more than it, I thought it did in studying this out, but, uh, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about rest, but really the idea behind the rest that the Bible talks about is it's a, it's a trust rest, if you will. You know, whenever you take a moment and you rest, that means that you're, you, you quit trying to work things out on your own. You take a moment and you say, you know what, I'm going to trust God. Faith rests. Amen. And so, uh, so here in Matthew, this is Jesus talking. Matthew says this. He says in verse 28, he says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For take my yoke. Well, last time we were together, we saw that word yoke literally means Jesus talking about my teachings. He says, take my teachings upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke, my teaching is easy, and my burden is light. In the Message Bible, it gives a little more clarity here. It says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me, and watch this, it says, you'll recover your life. Amen. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace, and I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Boy, I like that, don't you? Anybody ever, ever just going through life just... You just felt this heaviness, you know? You just, you just felt this heaviness. Notice, get away with me and you'll recover your life and I'll show you how to take a real rest. And then uh, we referred to this. If you'll look at John chapter 14, if you study these scriptures out, this is actually some of Jesus' last teachings. These are, you know, if you're giving somebody your last words, it, these are the most important things. And Jesus says in, in John chapter 14, verse 27, he says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. In, in other words, he's saying, you know, the world's peace comes from where you live, what you have. But he says, my peace I give unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And then over in John chapter 16, Again, seeing the same thing, just written a little different way. John 16, verse 33, it says, Jesus says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation. That word tribulation is just another word for pressure, anxieties. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And then another scripture, Mark chapter 6. Come unto me, he says, come unto me. And I'll give you rest. Mark chapter 6. 
Now just to set the, uh, I was looking at this before I came to church this afternoon, just to kind of set the stage before we're getting ready to read something here. Now we read this last time, but what I want you to see is this. This is just prior to John's beheading, okay? Um, John had confronted Herod because the Bible tells us in verse 17 and 18 that Herod had married his brother Philip's wife, and John had confronted Herod about it. And actually, verse 18 says, For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. Well, you know the story. The Bible says that there was, there was a meeting, there was a gathering for Herod's birthday, and Herodias' daughter came, and he said, I'll give you whatever you want, ask of me, and I'll give it to you up to half my kingdom. And she said, I want the head of John the Baptist. Because John had confronted them and said, you know, you can't marry. And, uh, and so she was upset about this. And so the Bible tells us Herod wasn't too happy with that. But it says, the king was exceeding sorrowful or sorry, yet for his oath's sake and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. So immediately, verse 27, immediately the king sent an ex executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head in a charger, gave it to the damsel, and the damsel gave it to her mother. Now watch this. That sets the stage for what we're getting ready to read. Now notice it says verse 30. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all the things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come you yourselves apart into a desert place and rest for a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. Well, how many of you know this was a heavy time? Mm -hmm. huh? You know, not just busy. We, we read this last week, and, and, you know, the Bible says that they were so busy about the Lord's business, they didn't even have a chance to eat. We've all had days like that, right? You know, Monday, school was out, and Sheila and I were up here. Caleb was working. We were all up here working, and before we knew it, it was 2 o'clock, 2.30, something like that. We, had, we worked straight through lunch. Well, if you know Pastor Mark, you know that just doesn't happen normally on a... <laughs> Daily basis at 11.01, we're out the door going somewhere to lunch. Well, we were busy. You know, we've all done that. You just get busy and busy about life. And, and, you know, and so the Bible says they didn't even take time to eat. But it wasn't just that they, they were so busy they didn't take time to eat. They were dealing with a heavy situation. I mean, here was John. He's part of the ministry. He'd just been beheaded. And yet the Lord said, notice what it says. The Lord said, come you yourselves apart in a, from a desert place and rest for a while, for there will be many coming and going. They had no leisure so much as to eat, and they departed into a desert place by ship privately. Well, how many of you know it's okay to take a break every once in a while? It's okay to take a breather. It's okay to get alone privately in the midst of those heavy times and those busy situations of life to take a vacation, if you will, to take a weekend getaway. We, Sheila and I went this, this past week to Asheville. We met some of our pastor friends from North Carolina, and we spent, spent a couple days in Asheville just getting away, you know. I'm not talking about getting carnal, you know. There's a big difference, but just getting, getting away, just, just taking a rest, just taking a break and meeting up with some friends. All that stuff's good, and the Bible advocates that. Good godly fellowship. But it's important to understand, you know, the Word does talk about a strong work ethic and the Bible talks about being diligent and, and work and working diligently but the Bible also stresses the need and the importance of rest. I read something, this is a, a new book if you can get your hands on it, this is a Tony Cook's new book. Tony Cook was of course a, a uh, he, was, he held what my position here for Pastor Hagen for, for many years, over 15, 18 years, something like that. And so he, he was known for his book In Search of Timothy, he's got one now In Search of Paul. Um, you know, a tremendous uh, man of the word. And so I just picked this book up. It's, it's the latest book he's got. And so I just happened to pick this up. And, and he, he says something in here that's very interesting in light of what we're talking about. So I want to read this to you. He says this in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. It says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden, Eden to tend it and to keep it. The working part of that verse is clear that Adam was put there to tend and to keep the garden. However, there's another aspect of this verse that may not be as evident. 
For when the Bible says that God put him in the garden, that doesn't mean that he just stuck at him there. One commentary actually says put in verse 15 translates the causative form of the verb to rest so it could be rendered literally he caused him to rest. Well, that's interesting. The pulpit commentary says God literally caused Adam to rest in the garden as an abode of happiness and peace. What does this mean to you and I? When God created man and placed him in the garden, he not only gave Adam a work assignment, but he also gave him a beautiful place to rest. See, work and rest were both part of God's plan for man. No doubt the fall complicated things for man, but God's original intentions should give us insight into what God really desires for us. That's interesting, isn't it? You know, there's, there's an old Greek saying that says, you will break the bow if you always keep it bent. That's good advice, isn't it? Look over at Luke chapter 10, very familiar passage of Scripture. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. And it says, And it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me alone to serve? Bid her therefore, and she help me. And Jesus answered and said, Martha, Martha, you are careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Well, what was the good part? Taking time to sit at Jesus' feet. Don't be, now listen, this was an important time. Jesus was in her house. You know what it's like to have company come to your house. You're going to do everything that you can to make sure that it's an enjoyable time and everybody's taken care of, and especially if it's around dinner time or, or supper time. Or, you know, you're going to make sure there's something for them to eat and, and you're going to take care of them, make sure the place is, is kept. And, you know. and so there was, there was much to do, but Jesus said, you know, there's more important things to do. And in this moment he was saying, how about doing like your sister and sit and listen for a minute? Take a moment and listen what the Word has to say. Notice it says, Martha, Martha, you are careful and troubled about many things. Some translations say distracted. Some translations say worried, full of care. You know, worry and cares. Think about this. Some of the biggest factors to living a long life on this earth are not physical, but they are spiritual. Now listen, I'm a big advocate. Uh, you know, I, I try to, to walk at least 30 minutes a day, uh, you know, at least five, five times a week. You know, I was dealing with some things when my, when my brother passed away. You know, I went to the cardiologist and, and did some things for my benefit and said, you know, I want to make sure that everything's going like it should in my body. And he gave me some recommendations and, and I try my best to, to follow those. And so, you know, I watch what I eat. I, he recommended cutting out the salt, cutting out the caffeine, and exercising a little bit. I'm a big advocate of that stuff. But you know, it, it's, not, it's not such a thing. Think about it this way. A strict diet and exercise regimen on eating organic is not an assurance that you're going to extend your life. Now, does it do your body well? Sure. Apparently, eating, eating organic and doing those kind of things and eating and having a good diet, those things are all beneficial to you. Right? You feel better when you eat better. Come on now. You feel better when you're eating better. You feel better when you've exercised a little bit. I'm not here to judge you. I'm, I'm just telling you, you know, a little common sense here. But, but listen... I'm all about a healthy lifestyle, making better choices when it comes to your body. But one of the biggest factors in extending your life is eliminating stress. It's eliminating these situations where you've got Mary and, and people sitting around the feet of Jesus and he's teaching and she's too busy serving that she's not paying attention to what's going on. We all get in those times. Stress is a killer. It'll age you. It'll cause you to die prematurely. Actually, you know, there's a number of scriptures. Paul, the Apostle Paul speaks of a time when he was in a time of distress. And actually, in, in 2 Corinthians 7, 5, 
you get the overall picture that he paints, and it's one that we can all relate to. In 2 Corinthians 7, 5, he says, when we, were came to, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. You know, I read that scripture, and of course that's in a, in, a, in a different translation here, but I read that passage of scripture and I thought, man, we've all been there before. We've all been there in the midst of situations where, where it feels like we just nothing's going right. You know, you're full of fear about a situation that's going on. You're, you, you're so busy that, that you haven't had rest. You know, we weren't designed to carry cares and stress and operate without rest. We're not designed that way. However, far too many believers take on this stress and it's on the day's agenda each and every day. Far too many stay upset, worked up, wound up, when what they need to do is just take a moment. Take a chill pill. You ever heard somebody say that? <laughs> just relax. I had to get a hold of this for myself about three years ago. I mean, I really did. And, and, and I've, I've drastically changed my lifestyle, drastically, because I realized that, that I, it was affecting my body to the point that my body was telling me that I was having a heart attack when there was no sign of it. I mean, none. I went to a cardiologist and did a stress test, did all these things, and, and he said, you're fine. He said, why are you here? So I told him, you know, my brother had passed away, and, and you know, my dad had had some heart attacks, and, and I, I just want to be proactive here. And he said, well, you're doing the right thing. Let me give you some things that you can do. And, and he said, the biggest thing you can do is avoid stress. I said, well, I'm in the midst of it right now. He said, well, stop it. <laughs> Come on now. Again, we all go through those times. We all go through those moments in life where it just seems like everything's coming against you and nothing's going right. I read an article in, in uh, Popular Mechanics, actually, and it was in regards to routine car maintenance. Well, you know, you should change your oil, rotate your tires, and have a routine maintenance. However, there are things that you are doing or not doing that actually could bring your car to a standstill. And this article in Popular Mechanics talks about this. And as I was reading about this, I thought, you know, this actually fits with what we're talking about. So indulge me for a minute. I'm not a gearhead. Y'all know that. But I like to go fast. I like to drive a fast car. And I like the new ones, not the old ones. Just throwing that out there, Tony Jenkins. <laughs> but he says that, because if you know anything about, about me and Tony, me and, you know, Bob Oliver, we used to go to these car shows, and uh, we, we just went to, the, I tell you, we just went to the World of Wheels in Chattanooga, took, took the boys, and they had a whole Hot Wheels thing going on, so we took the boys to the World of Wheels, and they have all these cars, and, and uh, man, I went straight to the, to the Stingray Corvettes, you know, the new Stingray Corvettes. But, but then they also had the 68s and the 47, this and that. And the, you know, I, I went to all the new cars. I like the new cars. And so, uh, so anyways, as you begin to look at these cars, you, you began to see, you know, these cars have been taken care of. I mean, they had some from the 40s, like a Ford truck, I think, or something from the 40s. I mean, it was well taken care of. It had all the original stuff in it. Man, it was impressive. It had been taken care of. But how many of you know there's some 40s trucks out there that are in the junkyard. They're a piece of junk because they weren't taken care of. Come on now, stay with me now. Think about this. One of the first things this guy mentions in this article about, about maintaining your car and extending the life of it, he says, he says, and I can relate to this one. He says, keep it clean. I can relate to that. He says, keep it clean because washing your vehicle does more than making it look nice. It aids in the longevity by keeping away the contaminants that cause corrosion. Note the importance of washing your car during the winter months especially. Well, you know, just, just this last week, and, and actually when we went to Asheville, we got on the road and not too far out of town, um, about 30 miles up, up uh, towards Knoxville, they had spread this, this uh, well, they call it beet juice and junk, brine, whatever it is. They'd spread this stuff all. Man, Sheila's car looked terrible. Still does, by the way. Because <laughs> it's, it's been raining, it's been cold, hadn't had a chance to. But you know, if, if, you know, for instance, if you live up north and you drive around on their roads all the time, they've got salt and sand and brine and all that. Man, those cars wear out fast because it just eats away at the paint. 
I grew up in, in Texas. You know, there's a lot of dirt roads in Texas, and I had friends that lived on these dirt roads, and these guys wouldn't wash their cars, maintain them, because they were like, what's the use? What's the point? Well, it, it would rust away the, the, the body and the paint. It would mess it up, and, you know, if they didn't maintain them. Well, it helps with the longevity. Amen. Notice we're making spiritual applications here. You should take care of your body. Number two, he says, he says in this article, he says, lighten up. Lighten up. He says, the less the car weighs, the better it will drive. Because in fact, it's harder on the engine, the transmission, and the brakes. So he says this, so remove excess baggage. It'll help with your gas mileage as well. I'm telling you, I was reading this article and going, man, that's a good spiritual application right there. Remove the excess baggage. I think in life we carry around baggage we shouldn't be carrying, a, carrying around. The uh, Bible says, cast your burden over on me, for I care about you. Cast your burden, throw it over on him. Right? What about this, number three, I like this one. He says, start slow. He says, like you, your car needs time to get ready to roll after it's been sitting in the garage or in the elements for a while because the oil cools and sinks to the bottom, it takes time for the oil to recirculate. Driving immediately increases fr friction, wears components out quicker. Taking a moment and allowing the engine to warm up prolongs the engine's lifespan. Don't start your day going off 90 to nothing. Well, we, I've said it before, but you know, for me it works. Everybody works a different way, but for me it works best for me to roll out of bed and go up to my office and take some time to get into the Word and study and quiet my mind and ease into the morning. For me, that works best. Now again, you've got to figure out your routine, but, but, but get what you can out of this. You know, start slow. Don't go off 90 to nothing. Take some time. Take some time in the Word. Take some time in prayer. Get your morning start off right. Number four, he says this. He's talking about flooring it. How many of you ever noticed the tachometer right in front of you between your steering wheel? You're looking straight at it. You ever notice that there's a, there's a red area in your tachometer somewhere between seven and eight, I think? You ever notice that it's in red? They like from about seven, seven and a half or so, all the way to the end, it's in red? Well, it's red for a reason. Because running at high RPMs continuously and redlining the engine burns fuel faster and increases the strain on the components of the engine. That red zone is there for a reason. Now again, I like to go fast. I've got a fast car out here. But if I go through town 90 to nothing and have my foot on the gas and don't ever come off of it, how many of you know I'm going to get into some trouble? Well, we do that in life too, don't we? So it's important to take care of yourself. You can't live life in the fast lane. And a failure to heed any of these four things that we mentioned here can cause serious damage to your car, but it can also spiritually, the same way, it can cause you some unnecessary costs, and the same applies spiritually. It's interesting, isn't it? Here's a good example. Look over at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, the Bible talks about Paul's young assistant, Epaphroditus. He actually nearly killed himself because he worked too hard and lacked proper amount of rest. See, the Philippine church, the Philippian church had sent him to Paul to help in the work of the ministry. And so in uh, verse number 26, we see here, Philippians chapter 2, verse 26. Actually, back up to uh, verse 25. He says, Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that he had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, not only on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. And I sent him therefore the more carefully that when you see him again, you may rejoice, that I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service towards me. 
Notice, receive him therefore in the Lord with gladness and hold such men in esteem because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply that which was lacking in your service towards me. The Weiss translation renders verse 30 this. It says, he recklessly exposed his own life. The message reads, in the process of finishing up the work, he put his life on the line and nearly died for it. Man, think about that. Did you notice Paul didn't necessarily condemn Epaphroditus for this? Notice he says regarding. As a matter of fact, he said, hold men in such esteem, but in pointing out the nature of the problem that he overextended himself and failed to pace himself, he was also warning others not to follow in the same pattern. Well, in these four, uh, four or five short passages here, what you can see is, is a few things. Number one, you can't neglect yourself while trying to save the world. You got to take care of yourself. Number two, you have limitations and you have needs. You got to take care of yourself. Number three, respect your limitations and meet your needs in healthy, appropriate ways. Now, I'm somebody, I'm somebody that, you know, remember in the, in the first message we talked about being a workaholic? You know, if I'm not careful, that's me. I can't, I don't like to sit still. So you can imagine the last few days, like when school was out and, you know, we, the, the threat of snow and all that kind of stuff. I can't sit around the house. Two weeks for Christmas vacation, and I'm done. I've got to get busy. I've got to find something to do. I can't sit still. Well, I tend to lean more towards being a workaholic. And if I'm not careful, then I end up running myself into the ground. I could be Epaphroditus real quick, where for the work's sake, I'm endangering my life. Well, you know, this is an extreme situation, but if you don't take care of yourself, you can run yourself into the ground. Right? Right? Come on now. Well, what else? If you don't take care of your own well-being, no one else will. I mean, if you know your wife can't do it for you. That's right. <laughs> and she said, that's right. Your husband can't do it for you. Huh? You got to do it for yourself. My lovely wife told me the other day, she said, you're closer to 50 than you are 30. I said, God bless you. Thank you for reminding me. Notice, you're also the steward of your own spiritual, emotional, and physical health. Now understand something as we talked about, because we talked a lot about the Sabbath the other day on, on uh, the first message. We're not under the Old Testament law of the Sabbath, but there is a Sabbath principle that is universal and needs to be observed. We need seasons of rest, refreshing, and rejuvenation. Isn't that right? You remember Benjamin Franklin, among one of the leading intellectuals of his time, of course, the signer of the Declaration of Independence. He said this, He that can take rest is greater than he that can take cities. Now listen, I know that this seems like a real simple message to you. Like, well, this is just common sense. We should rest. Yeah, but I'm speaking to a room full of people that I know because, because everybody that's in here on a Wednesday night, you guys are the ones that serve in the church. You guys are the ones that, that help keep this thing going. And if you're not careful, you push and you push and you push and you push and, and you don't take care of yourself. Right? I have a personal relationship with every single one of you in here. I know that at any given time, all of you, because of, the, of wanting to serve the Lord, you could at any given moment neglect the things that you need to do and you need to take a moment and you need to rest. That's what the Bible talks about. Psalm 127.2 said, It is vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows, for he gives his beloved sleep. In the Amplified it says, For he gives blessings to his beloved even in his sleep. The Passion Translation says, God can provide for his beloved even while they sleep. And then my favorite translation says, I laid down and slept soundfully, then I awoke to find that the Lord had taken good care of me. I, I woke up and found that the Lord had taken good care of me. Charles Spurgeon, often referred to as a pastor's pastor, said, Rest is not a waste of time. It is an economy to gather fresh strength. A little pause prepares the mind for greater service in a good cause. In the long run, we shall do more by sometimes doing less. Remember, we, we read the scripture last time, 
David, speaks of David fleeing from Absalom, his son, excuse me, when his son was coming after him, it says in verse 5, chapter 3, verse 5 of Psalms, it says, I laid me down and slept, and I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. Notice the key word here, that word sustain, is a translation of the Hebrew word, which refers to the act of supporting or upholding or undergirding. Well, notice, knowing that he provides for you even while you sleep is him sustaining you and strengthening you. To sustain means to bear, to support is a foundation. You know, to sustain me, it's referring to the pillars of a superstructure. It's the undergirding. It's something that keeps from falling or sinking as a weight sustains or as a rope sustains weight. It also talks to maintain. In music, sustain means to hold a note through the whole length. So this word sustain here, we see a number of times in Scripture. In Psalm 55, 22, it says, Cast your burden upon the Lord, and He shall sustain you. Well, where's your burden go? Well, it's telling you don't, don't carry the burden. He says, cast it over on Him. Throw the burden over on Him, and He shall sustain you. He shall never the suffer the righteous to be moved. Or one translation says, shaken. Psalm 16, 8 says, I have set the Lord continually before me because He is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Notice, if something is shaken, what does that mean? If it's shaken, it's, it's moved from its foundation. It's moved from its secure place. If something is shaken, it's weakened at the stability of. To shaken literally means to cause to waver or to doubt. Well, whenever you get to that point where you're exhausted and you haven't had any rest, you can't be in faith and trust God if you're, rest, if you're not in rest at a period of rest and, and you've got cares and worries and burdens that you're carried around. See, true rest finds itself with faith in God, trust in God. 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 says that you not soon be shaken in mind or be troubled. Psalm 4, 8 says, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for you, Lord, only make me to dwell in safety. Notice, faith sleeps well at night. I said faith sleeps well at night. You ever have those restless nights? It's because you had something on your mind that you were trying to figure out so that you could tell the Lord how to fix it for you? I'll say that again. You ever have those nights where you're trying to fix something for the Lord and you, had all, you needed all the answers so you could get up in the morning and tell Him how He was going to fix it for you? We've all had those nights where we're restless and we can't sleep and we're full of worry. But again, faith sleeps well at night. Here's a great example of this. In Acts chapter 12, the Bible refers to Peter... Chapter 12, verse number 1, says, Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he had killed James the brother of John with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to the four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter therefore was kept in the prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him in for him forth the same night, now pay attention here, what was getting ready to happen to him? He already knows that Herod has killed and beheaded several of the disciples. So here he was, he's been caught, he knows what, what's getting ready to happen, what's getting ready to happen? He's getting ready to lose his head. And so the Bible says in verse 6, it says, When Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. So he's asleep. I don't know about you, but if I knew I was getting ready to be beheaded in the morning, I don't know that I'd be asleep. I don't know that I'd be asleep. And so here he is, he's asleep between the soldiers. And it says, verse 7, Behold, the angel of the Lord came unto him, 
light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up and said, Arise quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird yourself and bind on your sandals. And so he did, and he says unto him, Cast your garment about you and follow me. Now listen, if you're in prison and you're chained up and you're between two, two guards here and the light comes on, the chains fall off, the door opens up and an angel says, let's go, I'm out the door. But he was in such a state of peace and sleep that the Bible tells us that the angel smote him on the side, raised him up quickly. The angel had to tell him, put your clothes on. He had to tell him, put your shoes on. He had to tell him, put your garment around you. And he had to tell him, follow me. That sounds like trying to get your kids out of bed. I was reading this story again for, for tonight and, and I was picturing those days, now it's long gone, but I was picturing those days uh, of trying to get the kids out of bed. You know, those days for school and going up to Matthew's room and, and you know, hey, it's time to, to get up. With Matthew, you had to go in there two or three times because the first time wasn't enough. You know, Sheila would go in there and kiss him on the forehead, hey baby, it's time to get up and pat him on the back and, and then next time it'd be a little... Little sterner, come on, son, it's time to get up. But then the third time be, hey, get your tail out of bed. Let's go. Amen. <laughs> well, as this story's going on and we're reading about this, you get the, you get the picture here. He's in such, such a state of peace and sleep that the angel is having to literally grab a hold of him, pick him up, and say, come on, boy, let's go. Faith sleeps well at night. He wasn't toiling. He wasn't trying to figure things out. He, wasn't, he was at peace because his trust was in, in God Almighty. Are you with me? The angel was having to wake Peter up the way that you wake your kids up. Understand this. The only requirement in order for you to partake in this kind of rest is faith and faith alone. Hebrews 4, 3 says, For only we who believe can enter in to his rest. I like to say it this way. Did you know that God is not at a loss as to how to turn your situation around? He's not trying to figure it out. He's not wringing his hands. He's not, he's not twiddling his thumbs. He's not scratching his head saying, Well, I, you know, I didn't plan on this. I didn't know this was going to happen. No. He's not at a loss. He's got your answer. All you got to do is trust Him. I like this. Pastor Rod Parsley said, God can make the rest of your life the best of your life. Doesn't matter what's happened up to this point. Doesn't matter what you might be going through. Doesn't matter what's happened in the past. God can make the rest of your life the best of your life. I believe it. That's why I like to say as many times as I can, the best is yet to come. Your best days are ahead of you. Because as long as God is at the forefront of what it is that you're going through, as long as your trust is in Him, He has a way. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Casting all of your care, the whole of your care upon Him, for He cares for you. Look back at Psalm 116. Psalm 116, just different passages saying the same thing. Psalm 116, verse number 1 through 7 says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Because he has inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compass me, and the pains of hell got hold of, upon me, and I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord, O Lord, I beseech you, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. It was brought low, and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with thee. And you're there in Psalm 116. Turn back to Psalm 46. Psalm 46. Psalm 46, verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, 
a very present help in trouble, therefore we will not fear. Though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and trouble, and be troubled, though the mountains shake with swellings, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of our God, and the holy place, the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved, and he uttered his voice, and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he has made in the earth. For he makes wars to cease unto the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow, he cuts the spear asunder, and he burns the chariot with fire. Be still and know that I am God. For I will be exalted among the heathen, I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I'll say this, whenever we feel alone, whenever we feel isolated in the midst of the situations we might be going through, we can always take comfort in knowing that God will never abandon us. Wherever we go in life, He always goes with us. Do you know in the midst of life's greatest storms, you can find peace and you can find rest? In the midst of the storm. In the midst of hell itself. In the midst of everything coming against you. In the midst of situations where it looks like there is no way out, in the midst of those moments, in the midst of life's greatest storms, you can find peace and you can find rest. Because faith sleeps well at night. Faith rests. Not, not only talking about a physical rest, you understand, but a spiritual rest. Faith trusts God. Faith quits toiling. Faith quits trying to work it all out and you just simply say, Father, I trust you. Amen. Everybody stand to your feet. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In the midst of life's greatest storms, you can find peace and you can find rest. I like that. Be still and know that I am God. That's the only thing you need to know tonight. Is all you've got to declare, whatever it is you might be going through, whatever it is, if you're praying for somebody, somebody in your family maybe, the only thing that you need to declare is you alone are God. Be still and know that He alone is God and He is God Almighty. Glory to God. Everybody lift your hands, lift your voice. Father, we praise you tonight. Glory to God. We choose to lift our voice. We choose to praise you in the midst of life's storms. We choose to declare tonight that you alone are God. You alone are to be trusted. So we quit trying to figure things out on our own. We quit, we quit wringing our hands, but we cast that care and that burden and that worry. We cast it all over on you, for you said in the word, for you care for us. And we choose not to pick it back up again. And we choose to rest in the knowledge that you've got it all under control. Glory to God. Amen. I'm reminded of something Keith Moore, I read Keith Moore said, and I've heard him say it, but he says this, he says, if it shows up in your life, you are well able to overcome it. If it shows up in your life, you are well able to overcome it. So be still and know that he is God. Can you do that tonight? Amen. Praise God, praise God. Well, we're so honored that you came to be with us tonight. Pastor Mark and Miss Margaret will be back with us on Sunday. Come ready to go, ready to worship. Grab somebody, grab somebody, bring them. This is the very message that they need to hear, that there is a God and they are not him. Right? <laughs> Amen. Quit trying to figure things out on your own and just submit your life to Him and He'll help you out. Praise God. God bless you. We love you. You're dismissed. Don't forget, prayer starts in just a few moments, probably about 15 minutes here.